Hello, and welcome to the Knit and Grace podcast. This is episode 17. Welcome or welcome back if you are a returning viewer. If you are new here, my name is Mia and I am the maker behind Knit and Grease. And it has been quite some time since I have posted on this channel. And so um, welcome back if you're a returning viewer. Thank you for sort of sticking with my little bit of a hiatus. And if you're new here, welcome. Um, I am Mia. As I mentioned before, I live in northern New Jersey with my husband and our two cats. And we recently had a big move um which is why I have sort of been MIA but in terms of what we get up to on this channel um I get up to all fiber arts related things a lot of knitting a lot of sewing I'm starting to dabble in spinning and whatever else tickles my fancy so hopefully uh, that is something that interests you and if it is grab a cup of cool. grab a cup of something cozy and we will get settled in. Um, so I guess uh, just to start with this is going to be <laughs> okay so I guess um, I should start with uh, we are filming from our new place and <laughs> where I'm filming from today happens to be street side. Uh, unfortunately, our apartment is not as quiet as our old one. So there is some construction going on and hopefully I am able to edit most of it out. Um, and I'll definitely probably have to um, take breaks along the way but there is like a water main being fixed or something like that but in terms of today's episode we are looking at the traditional podcast style so I'll go everything over everything that I've knit since we've last spoken what I'm currently working on and what I plan on working on over the next month or so um, we also have a few new segments that are will be part of the podcast uh, for this year since we are doing somewhat of a no buy um, and yeah, so before I get into all of that, I guess I will do a little bit of a life update, um, before we get started. And as always, I include timestamps. So if this is something that doesn't interest you, you can always skip around. Um, but we have moved. So we're still in northern ish New Jersey. We've moved from the suburbs to Jersey City, right outside of New York. Um, and yeah, it is, it's been a very big transition. We've also downsized significantly. And um, it's just been a very crazy time of year. I think um, we moved 
officially on February 1st was like the big move day, although we'd been moving um, some of our things into storage beforehand. Um, also, we're moving into or we've moved into a rental unit that my family owns. So I also had to coordinate a lot of sort of construction and painting and electrical work that needed to be done. So um, it was a very, very busy January for me. And then uh, we moved on the 1st, we handed in our keys at our old place on the 8th, and then on the 16th, we were off to our yearly getaway to visit our grandparents in South Carolina. So February was quite the month, and that is unfortunately why I took some time away from the podcast. Now, you all haven't seen me for about a month, a month and a half. I actually haven't recorded at all in 2024. So the content that you all saw earlier this year in January were all actually filmed in December. So if I'm a little rusty, just please bear with me, but that is why. So this is actually the first time that I am sitting down. Today is March 14th to film in 2024, which is crazy to me. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, we're, we're settling in, we're getting used to new commutes. Um, it's a lot nicer not having to leave the house as early when I go into the city, although the commute time is about the same. Um, you know, people don't realize, like, if you live anywhere outside of Manhattan, it takes forever to get into Manhattan, regardless of how close or far you are. So um, it's just a little bit of a different commute, and I can leave a lot later in the morning. So um, yeah, I'm just getting used to being in the area again and and all of that kind of stuff so lots and lots going on and I'm sure we will chat about all those things over the next however many years we are in this apartment um but I guess with that sort of out of the way we can get into the proper podcast stuff if you will so as always, we are going to start today's episode with what I'm wearing, and it is actually going to be a project spotlight. It is my first finished object of the podcast, and it is my citrine jumper by Inez of Their Knit, and as always, I'll insert a finished object picture here for you so that you can see what this beautiful sweater looks like. Since I am sitting quite close to the camera and unfortunately I can't show you on my body right this moment. But yeah, so this is the Citrine Jumper. It's by Inez of Their Knit. And as always, all of my Ravelry project pages will be linked below. And if Ravelry is not accessible to you, you can always reach out to me for additional information. So this jumper is a top-down construction. It is a raglan construction. Um, it does have a compound raglan. So that means that the raglan is going to fit really well across all the sizes. Um, although that does mean that you need to pay a little bit of extra attention when you're working the actual raglan. Um, it features short row shaping for the back of the neck you know, to sort of raise it a little bit. Um, and then it has this cable detail that's all along the neckline. It actually follows down through the raglan increases and it's also featured on all the hems. So the sleeve and the body hem. Um, and yeah, it's this just this beautiful textured pattern that actually looks like ribbing when you're looking at it at first glance, but it's actually a faux rib that's created very cleverly using a slip stitch. Um, there are also multiple modifications that are included in the pattern, um, not just your regular sort of like lengthening and shortening, but uh, there are instructions for how to calculate your bust starts so that you can work your bust starts within the pattern. There's also um, shaping for the body, so you can have either a straight body or an A-line body as well. And there are also shaping options for the sleeves. 
So it is a really, really great pattern. I really enjoyed test knitting this pattern for Inez. Um, it is out in the world. When did it come out? Um, it came out a couple of weeks ago, but of course, as always, I'll link everything below. Um, and yeah, I mean, I couldn't be happier with how mine turned out. Um, with regard to the yarn that is used for the pattern, I actually did use the yarn that the pattern was designed in. And so this particular pattern, and if you follow Inez on Instagram, um, she actually had a live, an Instagram live, where she sort of explains her design process. But this um, sort of design was, or this pattern was a merging of you know not only the design but also the yarn so the design was actually or you know the pattern is very much intended for this specific yarn and so I actually wanted to go ahead and use it and so the yarn is a DK weight BFL Massum blend and um, there are several dyers that actually do dye this blend and so originally Inez um, knit hers in woolen twine um who is a german dyer of this yarn and so it is a 75 percent bfl 25 percent massim and it is a dk weight non-superwash yarn and for my um sweater which is a little bit more accessible within the us and canada i chose to go with sounder yarn co and so for Sonder Yarn, it is called their Sunday Morning DK Base. And so they also have a four ply, which is a fingering weight version of the same yarn. And so this one is Sunday Morning DK. And yeah, so mine is in the color Toast and Honey. And the yarn support was kindly provided by Sander Yarn Co. for this test for me. So I was gifted the yarn for this project. So I want to thank Melissa for providing that yarn for me. Um, so more to say in terms of my specific sweater, and if you see me looking down, I'm just looking at my notes. In terms of my specific sweater, I chose to knit the size eight, which is uh, intended for a bust size of 44 to 46 inches. And I have a 46 inch bust. I got gauge on US four needles, which is 3.5 millimeter needles as my main needles. And I used about 450 grams of the Sunday morning DK, which is just under five full skeins or hanks of the Sunday morning DK. And um, I think six are recommended for my size or indicated for my size, but I do often shorten patterns, which I have in this case. And so because I am very, very petite, I'm only 4'11", and so usually I do use quite a bit less yarn than a pattern calls for. Um, and then in terms of additional modifications, so I did shorten the sleeves, I did shorten the body um, to account for my height, but I also did incorporate a two inch bust art. And I really enjoyed the way that Inez has laid out the bust arts. So instead of having sort of, um, you know, multiple, bus starts written out because it can get to you a lot depending on how you know how much difference people need in the bus start um and so for those who are not aware a bus start is essentially where you are knitting short rows back and forth to add extra fabric in the front to accommodate for breast tissue so that way when you are standing the bottom hem of your sweater is perpendicular all the way around. 
And so the way that Inez has gone about this is she's actually inserted a worksheet so that you can calculate your bus starts based on your gauge. This is also um, good because sometimes you, while you might have like the correct stitch gauge, you might have a different row gauge um, from what a pattern calls for. So using your specific gauge that you are knitting your pattern at, you can calculate your bus starts and then she has very detailed instructions on how to go ahead and carry those out. Um, I will say it is a very detailed pattern. It is a pretty long pattern um, because again, with the different um, sort of compound raglan and shaping it can be different across sizes. So it is a bit of a hefty pattern, but Inez walks you through every step of the way. I will say this is probably one of the few patterns that I will not recommend to a beginner. Um, maybe not even a confident beginner um, because there is a lot, a lot, a lot going on. So when I did um, rate this on Ravelry, I did rate it intermediate and Inez does actually rate it as intermediate as well. Um, and it's specifically around a lot of the shaping, especially when you're starting the project, because you're actually, you know, not only are you doing your short row shaping for like the back, but as you're doing your shaping, you have to keep your textured stitches in line. You're also keeping the, um, you're also keeping the cable pattern in a specific way. Um, so I'm not saying it's like absolutely undoable. It definitely is one of those that, you know, I kind of just like popped on some jazz and just, you know, made sure to mark off every single step of the way. But I don't recommend this pattern for, you, for a beginner. I definitely think that it is an, an, it is an intermediate pattern. Um, that said, absolutely love the pattern. I think it's laid out really well. I really enjoyed the test experience. It was a really nice long test. There was a lot of interaction from Inez as well as the other testers. Um, and yeah, you know, and you know, the feedback process was very good. Inez was, you know, very cognizant of feedback that we provided um, and, you know, made sure to incorporate all of that into the pattern to even, I think, like the night before pattern release date based on my feedback and a couple of other folks' feedback because we do have a little bit more of a, a more of a humped back from sitting at desks all the time. She actually even included some additional notes on fitting, like even up until the night before um, to make sure that the pattern was perfect. So a really lovely pattern, really lovely designer, really lovely um, design sort of test knit process uh, that I was very excited to take part in. So with that, I feel like this is going to be a very, very long episode, but I mean, I guess that kind of makes sense if you haven't put out a podcast in two months. I will get started with my finished objects. And the first finished object that I have to show you all, or I guess the second finished object, since the first one was the uh, pattern spotlight of the episode, is the stripe pipe sweater by Veronica Lindberg. And so this one, unfortunately, I don't have finished objects pictures of for this project yet. And I don't know that I'm gonna, I, I can't commit to getting them um, before this podcast goes up. But this is what it looks like. So this is the front, this is the back. And what I will do is I will have sort of detailed information in my Ravelry as to how I kind of did the colors because I think it is meant to have, what do we have? One, two, three, four. It's meant to have five different colors and I've only used four here, right? One, two, three, four. Yeah, so it's meant to have five different colors for the stripes um, and I've only used four. So I've repeated the brown up top 
on the sleeve. You are supposed to have a different color for here. Um, so it uses six colors total. And this is another project that was done as part of a collaboration. So this was part of um, Hobie Yarns um, No Shades of Grey challenge that took place earlier this year and kind of just like, you know, getting ready for spring when we're in those cold, dark winter months in the Northern Hemisphere. So this yarn was also um, kindly gifted as part of that challenge and so yeah so again this is the stripe pipe by veronica lindberg i kind of did a custom size because my gauge was off while um the yarn that i use which i'll talk about in a second is classified as a dk weight yarn i think it's really more like a sport weight it's definitely a light dk maybe even a sport weight so my gauge was a bit tighter than the intended gauge for the pattern and i didn't want to sort of knit it at the bigger gauge of the pattern and then have kind of you know kind of like too airy of a fabric so at the smaller gauge, what I did was I followed the instructions for the fifth size to ultimately get a sweater um, that fit the fourth size, which is about 50 inches. And again, my bust size is 46, so about four inches of positive ease. Um, in terms of the needles I used, I used a US 6 or 4 millimeter needle as my main needle, which I believe is actually the recommended needle in the pattern. And I used Hobie Highland Wool for this one, which is a DK weight 100% Peruvian wool. And so um, I sort of chose to do this collab with Hobie for a number of different reasons. So I'd never actually tried any of their yarns before and they're actually coming out with a lot more natural yarns or what I consider natural yarns like you know 100% non-superwash yarns. Um, but they do have a really great mix of non-superwash yarns as well as you know superwash or even acrylic based yarns. Um, and I really wanted to use them also as you know sort of to try out their yarns but also you know here in the U.S. we have Knit Picks which kind of has a very similar feel in terms of the different lines of yarns that they have and the content and whatnot um, but I know that Knit Picks is not accessible a lot of the times or at all really to ship internationally. So it's really just US and Canada. So I wanted to try something or a yarn company that would be better for international folks that might watch the podcast. Um, and yeah, I actually, the yarn I actually love, it really reminds me a lot of the um, Highland wool from um, knit picks, but or uh, wool of the Andes is what they call it. But the wool of the Andes, I believe, is only in worsted weight. It's not in DK weight. Um, so it definitely has that feel. Um, it's very budget friendly. It's very nice. Um, I have worn this about two times. I haven't had any kind of pilling or anything like that. Um, and it is, you know, again, just extremely affordable, really nice. In terms of the colors that I used, my main color is champagne, which is this beige color. And then um, this brown color is called autumn leaf. This green color is called Verde grease. Um, the pink is called cherry blossom. And this purple is called dusty lavender. And yeah, I just wanted to sort of knit a simple sweater for spring that was lightweight, especially because we were going to the beach. And so I did wear this while we were on the beach um, so that it could be a lightweight spring sweater. Because a lot of my pullovers are denser or, you know, a heavier weight and um, which is great for like fall and winter. But in the spring where you have, you know, the beginning temperatures being like in the 40s and then by the end, like 
like today we're ending up at 70, um, it's not ideal to have a really heavy weight sweater. So I wanted a really lightweight sweater, which this definitely sort of checked the box for that. And yeah, in terms of additional modifications, um, which is something that's called for in the pattern, um, because again, I am shorter, there are some ways that you can sort of adjust the length of the body and the sleeves by omitting one of the stripes, which I actually did follow that modification. In terms of the pattern itself, and um, this is one of those that I'm a little conflicted, and I think I'm actually going to do a knit and chat um, about this one. I'm not going to say kind of like, I'm not going to necessarily <laughs> say anything bad about the pattern. The pattern was well written. Um, it had all the information you needed. Everything was very well laid out for you in the pattern. Um... And I think part of this is maybe sort of my own experience that I'll go into as well. Um, but the pattern is very, very basic. Um, very basic, even more basic than like a petite knit pattern. There's absolutely like no shaping in the back of the neck. There's nothing like that. It's literally just pretty much four rectangles um, to make this drop shoulder sweater, which is perfectly fine if you are a super, super new beginner and you really need someone to hold your hand every step of the way, this is probably the pattern for you. If you are a confident beginner, you've knit a sweater before, you have another drop shoulder sweater pattern that you really like, you can look at the pictures and really make this on your own and probably have a better fitting and just better constructed sweater, if I'm completely honest. Um, and I think that part of the disappointment that I have was with the sweater was like a little bit of the hype behind the sweater, right? A lot of people are making it. It has a lot of finished objects and also the designer, um, themselves kind of, you know, someone that I have followed on YouTube occasionally and seems to be someone that really cares about fit when they're designing. And I think that as I watch more, and then as I kind of, you know, went through like sort of the Reddit <laughs> um, wormhole, what I've come to realize is that maybe the designer is a little bit more concerned with fit of the sample garment than the fit of all the other garments. Um, and again, it's a very basic sweater. It actually fits well because I wanted something just oversized boxy and it actually is very oversized boxy, but I think I could have also gotten the oversized boxy look and still had it fit just a tiny bit better um, if I had done it on my own. And it's one of those situations where I was looking at the pictures in the pattern and I was like, this kind of looks like it's just for rectangles, right? But because of sort of the good marketing and, uh, you know, and kind of like the fact that so many people have done it or made it, I was like, there has to be something more to this pattern that I'm not understanding that I, as a knitter, can't just say like, hey, I'm looking at the stripes. I can figure out how many rows there are based on the picture and I can recreate it using another drop shoulder sweater pattern and the reality is when I bought the pattern that was not the case it really is exactly what you see in the picture it is four rectangles and I mean again there's like a little bit of shaping and things like that, but not anything that you can't follow your own personal drop shoulder sweater pattern that you already love that fits you really well um and sort of make it for yourself like it's to the point where like I would even just pause it to say, like, even if, like, let's say you have a petite knit, like, Stockholm sweater pattern. I actually have the Stockholm sweater pattern. It's, it's, you're better off using your existing Stockholm sweater pattern and, it, like, making stripes than buying this pattern. And I hate saying that, but I was just really disappointed. And I have to be honest with you all about that. You know, I kind of like I did fall into the hype and I did buy the pattern. And, you know, at the end of the day, you know, 
definitely want to support an indie designer. Um, but I was a little disappointed in that. Um, and so, yeah, so those are my thoughts on the Stripe Hype sweater. So the next two projects I no longer have in my person. So I will insert pictures of them here for you all. And if you've been following me on Instagram, you will see or you have will have seen me make these. Um, although I haven't debuted the final sort of finished object pictures, which I very hastily snapped. Um, but these are sweaters for our sweaters. These are a pair of vanilla socks that I made for our grandmother. So as I mentioned, we were recently down to visit our grandparents. And um, when we were down there, they always just admire all of my knitting and all of the things that I'm knitting on. And I was wearing a pair of my own vanilla socks that I knit up in Patton's Croy. And they just absolutely loved them. So when my husband and I were out one day, we actually decided to stop by Michael's and get some Patton's Croy. And I knit them both a pair of socks over the two weeks that I was there and we gifted them to them on the last night that we were there and they absolutely love them. So in terms of the socks that I knit for Graham again, it is a just a vanilla sock pattern. I um, cast on 60 stitches. Um, I didn't want to go full on down to what would it be the 56 stitches um, just because she does have rheumatoid arthritis. So um, her feet are wider, but she also just has like a very, you know, kind of skinny <laughs> legs in general. She's a very, very petite woman. She's much smaller than me. She's probably 80 pounds soaking wet. So I cast on 60 stitches and I just knit these in a stockinette. Um, I used my regular reinforced heel I uh, uh, for the heel flap, so a slip stitch heel. And um, all of these have been knit, all of the socks that I'm gonna feature have been knit on a US one or 2.25 millimeter needles. For this particular pair, I use Patton's Croy, which I picked up as, at Michael's as I mentioned, and this color is called Blue Raspberry. And I did knit these socks as well as the socks for our grandfather in tandem because I wanted to make sure that the striping pattern matched. So the next pair of socks again are the socks for our grandfather. And again, just the vanilla sock pattern. For his, I did do my classic 64 stitch um, sock. He does have narrower feet for a man. So I sort of stuck with the same size that I use for myself. So 64 stitches. I did do a flat rib for his just because I wanted to make sure that they fit him perfectly and snugly um, because he does love to wear his wool socks in his sneakers. Again, use a US one or 2.25 millimeter needle. And for his, I used um, Patton's Croy sock in the color gray brown marl, which absolutely stunning and I think suits him really, really well. So I'm thinking that this might be a little bit of a tradition now every year when we go down to see them, we'll give them another pair of hand knit socks so that they can add some or have some woolly socks in their collection. So the next finished object is another pair of socks. <laughs> this is going to be the sock episode. Um, however, these are socks for myself. And I do have them here, so I'll hold them up so that you all can see them. And this is what they look like. And these I wasn't concerned about matching, so they are sisters, not twins. And I will go ahead and give you the details for these. So these socks are made using Katia Danubio sock. Um, in the color 300, there are no names for these colors. And this is yarn that I picked up um, as my souvenir yarn when my husband and I went to Brussels for Christmas of 2022. So we typically take a big trip every year around Christmas time as a way to celebrate our anniversary, which comes late in the year, and also get away 
for Christmas. And you know, you always have to get that souvenir <laughs> ball of sock yarn. I happen to have gotten two. And so finally got around to knitting up one of those um, socks. And so I actually only used about 60 grams for these socks. So I definitely have enough to make um, like probably a shorty pair of socks. Um, so again, I just used my regular 64 stitch vanilla sock pattern on a US one um, 2.25 millimeter needle. These I actually knit on a small circumference circular because I wanted to practice sort of that skill and because of that I also wanted to incorporate a different heel and so I did use the shadow wrap heel tutorial from Denise of Earth Tones Girl which I will link below and absolutely love how these fit. I was actually really shocked um, because I do have a really high arch and you know my preferred heel is a uh, reinforced slip stitch heel flap um but I was actually really really shocked by how well this heel fit now it is really funny though when you're like looking at it it kind of is like super pointy <laughs> like when I was blocking it it wouldn't like conform to the sock blocker um but other than the way that it looks super pointy it is a really fun heel to knit up um, anything else to say about this? I don't think so. Um, so I think that we can get into the last finish object for this episode. So the last finish object for this episode actually has not been blocked yet. I just finished it a couple of days ago and I've finally made an Oslo hat for myself. So this is what that is looking like. And I absolutely love it. I'm super excited about this one. And so this is going to be one of my yarn acquisitions for the month. Okay, I was trying to wait out some construction noise that's going on, but it's going on for a long time and I'm going to very quickly lose light here soon. So I'm just going to talk and hopefully in post-production I can sort of muffle out any background noise. But um, when we were down visiting our grandparents, we go to the Frayed Knot in Savannah every year to visit Jennifer and her lovely shop. And so I picked up a few skeins of yarn this being one of them, I finally decided that I was going to knit myself an Oslo hat after having knit one for my mom, my husband, my brother-in-law, and my sister. So I think the only per the only two people we're missing now are my brother and my father to get Oslo hats. Um, and yeah, so I picked up this beautiful yarn from West Yorkshire Spinners. It's called Color Lab DK, and the color is Latte Brown. Um, the actual number is 1135. In terms of the hat itself, this is my sixth time making this hat. Um, I made a size three, so I think it's like the adult's medium. Um, and I used just a US 4 3.5 millimeter needle, which the pattern calls for, which is what I've used every single time. Um, and I am really happy. The fit is really perfect. And now I just need to block it. And I think we're actually going to get a little bit of a cold snap next week. So I'll be able to wear it already. Um, and the funny thing is when I purchased this, because actually last year when we were down at the Frayed Knot, I purchased the yarn to make my sister and my brother-in-law their own Oslo hats. Um, mm -hmm. I made the cardinal mistake of looking at the pattern yardage as opposed to looking up the last time that I made this pattern to see how much yarn I actually used. And I could have gotten away with just one skein of yarn. And I did. This is one skein of yarn. I think I had maybe eight grams left over. Um, but 
I went based on the pattern yardage as opposed to the last time that I made this hat in this size. Um, and I ended up purchasing two skeins of yarn because it did say that I needed a little bit more than one or like in like maybe like 1.3 or 1.4 skeins. Um, and so now I have a lonely skein. So I will be looking for a lonely skein project. Um, my friend Haley of The Knit Weekend, who I'm sure you all watch, um, and if you don't, please go check her out, is having a almost year-long um, make-along uh, all the way through September where we use up our lonely skeins. So I have my first two lonely skeins to use. So as I showed you all before, I have this Sunday morning DK because I thought I needed six, but I only ended up using five. So I have one of these and then I have another one of this West Yorkshire Spinners Color Lab in the color Latte Brown. So those are going to be my first two lonely skeins. So if you have any recommendations on what I can make with one skein of either of these yarns definitely let me know in the comments down below and those are going to be my entry into Haley's lonely skein project for the year and so I do have two more finished objects that I finished um one I cannot show you at all it is a sample for Barocco, which has since gone off and um, been shipped off to them. So when that collection drops, I will go ahead and share those samples with you all. Um, and the other one is a test knit for Samantha Guerin. And so while we can share sort of our works in progress, we can't share the final item until the pattern's been released, which will be released later this month. So I'll go ahead and feature it in next month's podcast. But in the meantime, I can show you um, my swatch for that pattern. And this is another acquisition for the month. And um, this is what that swatch looks like. It is the swatch for this small fry scarf. And it is just a beautiful sort of skinny um, scarf that is knit in sport weight. So nice and lightweight, perfect for spring. I'll go ahead and insert a picture of her Instagram post here so you all can see. So I did finish that um, since the last podcast. However, I can't show that to you yet. But what I will do is I'll show you it. I have it all nice and rolled up here. And this is what it looks like. So that's all I can show you today. Okay. So as I mentioned, I'm quickly losing light. So hopefully I can get through my two whips before I have to turn on some artificial light. So we're going to move on to the works in progress portion of the podcast. So the first work in progress um, that I want to show you, and again, I think if you have watched my sort of goals video, you know that I want to always have a pair of socks on the go. So it is my pair of March socks. And this is also the last acquisition that I acquired while I was down in Savannah at the Frayed Knot. And this is what they're looking like. And again, it's just another pair of vanilla socks. And so these are a 64 stitch flat rib sock. So three by one rib. And I've just gotten started with the leg of the first sock. And I am using a crazy or zauber ball crazy to knit these up. And I just saw these colors when I was visiting Jennifer and I thought they just screamed spring so I needed to pick up this crazy zauber ball and I have knit with zauber ball crazy before um and absolutely love it I have a pair of monkey socks I want to say that I knit in zauber ball crazy if I have a picture of those I'll insert them here and so I have knit with the yarn before and yeah just a vanilla sock. And I absolutely love the colorway. It's called Shooting Star. Um, I'll have to look up what the actual color name is and insert that here for you as well as the number. But the English translation of the color is called Shooting Star. 
And so the second and last work in progress of today's podcast episode is another test knit for Samantha Guerin. And it is the test knit of her spring line tee. And so um, I am able to show you a little bit of the pattern. Um, this is going to be a drop shoulder t-shirt. It is work top down and it's a pretty plain, just plain Jane stockinette t-shirt that has a lovely lace pattern. Um, and I'm not going to get too close with it, but it has a lovely lace pattern um, on either side of the shoulder. And yeah, I'm really excited. I actually just finished the back, so I'm getting ready to pick up. Um, so this is the bottom, I guess. I'm getting ready to pick up my shoulder stitches. And so for this one, um, again, I'll insert a picture of what her tee looks like so you can see it for reference. But I am making the fifth size, which corresponds to 48 inch finished uh, garment. So two inches of positive ease. And for my summer garments, I don't use, I don't tend to like a lot of positive ease. So it's perfect for me. Um, and I did get gauge on the recommended needle size, which is a US four. And I am using this woolly knit cone. It's actually coming up a little bit purplish, but it's definitely a navy blue. Um, and actually, I think it's called navy. Yep, it's called navy blue. And so this is a woolly knit 100% cotton cone in the four ply. And so if you have been here for a while, you will know that this is the color that I use to make the stripes on my Parnell pullover or sweater that I made last summer. Um, and that is a free pattern by Barocco Design Studio. I'll go ahead and insert a picture of that here for you all. Um, but I used this color for the stripes of that. I used about 100 grams for the stripes and these are 400 gram cones. Um, so the, I'm using the rest of this cone finally up for this beautiful tea pattern. So I'm really excited that I'm able to, I think I got three cotton cones last year. So this will be the second project that I get out of those cones. I have a mustard colored cone that I actually want to make, um, the Salty Air Tea also by Samantha, Samantha Guerin in. Um, and I know she just came out with the Salty Air sweater, but I want to make the tea version. And so maybe at that point, I'll have to see how much of the cream navy and mustard I have left and maybe try to get a fourth garment. I think that would be pretty cool if I could get four garments out of three cones. Um, that's kind of like what I had envisioned when I bought those cones. So we'll see if that actually works out in the end. Okay, so looking at my viewfinder, it looks like there's still a little bit of light enough that you all can see me. And if anything, I can always lighten it up in post production. So I'm just going to keep going for as long as I can before having to turn on the lighting because obviously just natural lighting is so much better. Um, so in terms of acquisitions, this is a portion of the podcast that will likely not happen very often. Um, again, if if you've been here for a while, you know that I am having a sort of low buy year. It is technically a no buy year, um, but with um, certain exceptions, one of them being souvenir yarns. And when we went down south, I was like, okay, well, this is technically not souvenirs because we come down every year. We see the same people every year. We go to the same yarn shop every year. It's kind of like our second home, right? And even when we walked into the shop, it's so lovely to see Jennifer. And she was like, hey, you're here for your annual trip. And she was just so warm and caring when she greeted us. Um, so I was like, it is a little bit of a stretch to say that this is souvenir yarn, but you know, we're on vacation somewhat. So I'm just going to call it souvenir yarn. So I did pick up, um, those two 
um, colorways of the Patton's Croy Sock at Michael's, which is gift yarn. So again, doesn't really count toward the no buy year, as well as the souvenir skeins, which you've already seen. So the skein uh, for the scarf, as well as the Oslo hat and the pair of socks. So those are all yarns that I acquired and pretty quickly knit up. So I think that, you know, in that instance too, because I kind of bought them and knit them up right away, um, it kind of helps in that, in that situation. So I did want to show you one more thing that I got. And um, I finally was able to get the last page that I needed for my Thread and Maple binder. And so I showed you all my Thread and Maple binder in my Rhinebeck recap. So for my binder, I purchased the binder itself as well as one of the project pages during a second sale that Thread and Maple had. I want to say in September, it was like late, Oct late August, early September, they had a second sale and I was able to actually get the binder and a page for what would normally just be the price of the binder. So I just had to jump on it. And then when we were at Rhinebeck, I picked up two needle pages. So a, because I have two different sets of interchangeables. So the only page that I was waiting for was the cable organizer page, which is this one. Let's see if you can see it. So this is the cable organizer page and it was out of stock for a while because if you follow them, you know that they um, do all of their production in the Ukraine and because of the war going on, um, there's some supply issues. But this is what the cable organizer page looks like. There's the zipper for all of your notions for your interchangeables in there. And then here you have these little sort of plastic zips where you can put all of your cables. So I am really excited that I was able to finally get that page and I had actually saved up for it. So it was, you know, the money was just burning a hole in my bank account until I finally was able to get the page. And so my binder is finally complete. Um, and so what I think I'm going to do is I'm going to do a dedicated video just on my binder. So just like sort of the review of what I think of it so far, how I'm using it, how I'm living in it, and actually show you the details of the pages that I'm using, especially because I'm using the pages with interchangeable needle sets that are different from what they technically are made for. So I think that that's going to be a separate video that will come, you know, sometime down the pike. And I'm very happy to have finally been able to complete my binder.
so with that, I am going to move into a new portion of the podcast that I'm going to call Loving My Stash. And so as I mentioned before, and if you've been here for a while, you know that this year I'm really focusing on using my stash and ways to use my stash because um, especially with the move, it became very apparent that my stash has reached a size that I can't really comfortably house at the moment because we did downsize significantly. Um, We downsized from a 1600 square foot townhouse to a 600 square foot apartment. Um, And yeah, and I also just in general wanted to be a little bit more conscious of my purchasing and where my money was going. Um, We're also, you know, we sort of made this move so that we could save for a house. Um, We have other financial goals. I actually have a very large uh, tattoo piece that I am undertaking in a few weeks here. So there's tons of different directions that my disposable income is being pulled in. Um, And so, you know, besides the, you know, sort of money aspect of it, again, I want to be more cognizant of how much yarn I'm buying, and how much I'm consuming in general, and kind of overall, just like my consumption. So not even just like the yarn that I'm buying, but also the patterns that I'm buying and trying to maybe re-knit some patterns or knit patterns that I've purchased and I've never knit. Um, Because, you know, we always give in to sort of like the hype of a pattern being released and it being on sale and you're buying the pattern and then, you know, patterns are so inexpensive, you maybe don't, you know, sort of get around to knitting them right away. So kind of with all that in mind, I really wanted to focus on my stash. And I think that my stash in general has gotten to a place where I'm really loving everything that's in my stash. What I'm not necessarily loving or using, I've either donated or I have listed for DStash on my Ravelry account. So definitely check that out if that's something that you're interested in. Um, And yeah. So for today's episode of Loving Your Stash, and kind of this this portion will be called Loving Your Stash or Loving My Stash every episode, but it will likely change every episode. So for today's episode, I want to go through how I go about choosing a pattern for yarn I already have in my stash. And um, I will say that actually my friend Haley of The Knit Weekend recently put out an amazing, amazing video on yarn substitution. So I'll link that below for you all to go check that out. Um, Definitely has a lot of information in terms of what you might want to consider when substituting yarn. Um, But one of the ways that I often just like to think through how I'm going to use stash yarn is with the Ravelry sort of advanced pattern search. So I wanted to show you all what it is that I have in mind using and how I go about choosing a pattern. And then I'll let you know the pattern that I will be casting on this month as part of my loving of my stash. So first, let's start with the yarn, and it is technically two yarns, and so I will show you those now. They're black. (laughs) So this is a woolly knit four-ply British wool cone, and um, I have used some of this cone, and this is Drops Kid Silk. Um... I'll insert the color information below. This cone is just called Jet Black. Um, And yeah, so I'd actually originally purchased this cone with the intention of making my mom an Oslo hat. So I actually, my very first Oslo hat that I ever knit, I held two strands of this cone Um, held together with a strand of the silk mohair. So it was three strands total to make my mom a really, really warm hat. 
that's what she asked for. She asked for Christmas. She just wants a black, really, really warm hat. And so I had to deliver. And then I knew that, you know, obviously, it, you know, and it, I didn't just order the one cone. I ordered a few different cones to make it worth the shipping and all of that. And then I was like, well, you know, obviously I'm going to also think about this, you know, in a different way. How can I use it? And so I did initially think that I was going to make a pullover, just a classic black pullover um, sweater with this. And um, it just sat in my stash. And I just never got around to knitting it because there's always like the next best thing, right? And finally, I decided that I wanted to go ahead and knit this for two reasons. So I think that if you follow the podcast, you know, I'm always saying that I need more cardigans. And I'm like, I need more cardigans. I need more cardigans. I need more cardigans. I think all of us knitters are always saying we need more cardigans, but we keep knitting pullovers. Like, why do we do that? Why do we need knit pullovers if we need cardigans? It's probably because of the purling. Let's just be completely honest about it, right? So I've just been saying I need to knit a cardigan and I've had a few cardigans in the back of my mind and I'm like, okay, great. Then my friend Cece of Stitch Witch Craft sort of, you know, we've been ruminating and then she's been putting it out there. And then finally she decided that she is going to hold a make along over on Instagram, which is, um, it's called, is it like the year of the cardigan? I'll insert the the make along hashtag here for you all so that you can see. But essentially, we're all just going to spend this year finally, finally knitting up those cardigans we always say that we're going to make. So I decided, one, because this is one of the yarns that was easily accessible. Not all of my yarn is unpacked yet. And two, because I really do need a bl basic black cardigan, I'm finally going to knit the cardigan. And so I wanted to show you all how I use a Ravelry to help me choose a pattern and ultimately um, share that pattern with you all. I think I'm going to go ahead and switch to the overhead lighting right now because I think that you all can see me, but I'm having trouble seeing myself. So uh, I will be right back. Okay, I'm back. I feel like this is a bit yellow, but I'm, it is what it is. And apparently there are some folks on the street that have decided they're going to party it up a little early tonight. So hopefully, again, I can edit that in post-production. I'll try not to look at myself in the viewfinder and just worrying about color correcting later. But I wanted to go ahead and show you how I use Ravelry to sort of choose a pattern when I have yarn in my stash that I want to use and I don't know what pattern to knit with it. So I'm going to go ahead and pull up my phone. Let's go ahead and put it in do not disturb mode so we're not disturbed. And I do get asked this whenever I do sort of the screen shares of my phone is the app that I'm using and I am using an app called Rabbit. It is a paid for app, um, but I happen to love using it. So I didn't mind um, paying for it. And it is actually actually a really great way, especially if you do update your Ravelry very often, really great way just to even just upload your pictures from your phone to your Ravelry. Cause you know, it's a thing, right? It's a whole thing. So we're going to go ahead and um, get started. And I'm going to pop up the screen share here so you all can see what I'm doing now. Okay, so um, here I have um, the patterns page up. And so what you can see is you have a few things, a few um, 
tabs, I guess, down the bottom where you can sort by uh, patterns, yarns. You can look at your notebook. You have your forums that you're subscribed to as well as your Ravelry, which is like your account and all of that. And if anyone sends you messages, that's where you would go ahead and um, check them. But right now there are no filters set up here and it's just sorting by hot right now, which is the way that Ravelry sort of automatically sorts everything. And so I'm going to go ahead and put in a few sort of filters. And this works very similarly if you're using the desktop version of Ravelry as well. Um, so put in a few filters that are going to help me really identify what I want to knit. So in these, this top sort of filter button on the top right, right? That's my right hand. Yeah, it's my right hand. <laughs> the top right. We're going to go ahead and start putting in some filters. So first, I'm going to select knitting because that is what I want. Um, availability is like if you want to only look at patterns that are free or already in your library, we're going to leave that blank. Pattern category. This is where we're going to choose the category. I'm going to go ahead and click clothing. We're going to click sweater and specifically we want a cardigan. So we are going to select cardigan. Um, in terms of fit, we are going to choose adult. We are going to choose the weight. So because I'm holding a fingering weight and a mohair together, I'm actually going to go ahead and select two different weights that I wanted to look at. So because I'm really looking for probably ideally a gauge between 20 to 24 stitches to four inches. So I'm going to go ahead and click sport and DK. So that's going to give me about that gauge. Um, if you really wanted to, I think there is a very, uh, there is a specific gauge um, portion where you can actually insert your gauge. If you were working with limited yardage, you could go ahead and enter that in. Um, and yeah, so there's a lot of different things that you can, oh, so here's the gauge all the way at the bottom. So in four inches, you can enter in your gauge. So if I wanted to say 20 to 24 inches, um, we would enter that there. I'm just gonna leave it blank for now. The other thing that I want to show you is I have a very specific thought process as to how I want to construct this sweater. So we're actually going to go into the attributes. And so this is where we are going to look at the construction and the design elements. So specifically, I want to knit a sweater top down and I only want to knit a v-neck. So for construction, we're going to go ahead and select top down and then go back Oop. in our filters. So go back to the attributes and we are going to click on the design element. And I believe this is where, here we go, sorry, I totally, went right past it. So under design element, we're going to click on neck and I want a v-neck because that's what I want. I want a top down v-neck cardigan. So that's done. So I've gone ahead and inserted all of my filters. So I want a knitted cardigan that is knit top down, features a v-neck, it is knit for adult, and it is either a DK or sport weight pattern. You can also change the way that you sort it by, you know, any number of items. So whether it's the best match, the hot right now, the name, most popular, most projects, most favorited, etc. Um, I'm just going to leave it the default to hot right now. And we're going to go ahead and click done. And now we see all of the different patterns that are coming up that fit our sort of design what we're looking for. 
So in terms of what I'm looking for, I'm really looking for just like a plain um, stockinette pattern. I really do have a very specific look in mind. Um, so we have a lot of petite knit patterns because that's kind of what's coming up. Um, we have the Ava cardigan, which I really, really love. And I do really want to knit, but I have a different vision for the Eva cardigan than for this particular cardigan. So we're going to disregard that one. We have the April cardigan. Oh, Sari's new Mila cardigan. That is absolutely stunning. But today I really want to focus on that kind of plain stockinette cardigan. It looks like my... Filters may have gone a little awry because it is showing me some cardigans that are not v-neck But we do have the calm down cardigan, which is another one that is absolutely stunning and is on my list of two knit patterns this one though, I think that Because it does feature kind of it's not tons of detail, but it has some detailing along the drop shoulder um you know, and all of that, that I think I'm going to stay away from this one in a dark color yarn. I just think it might, you know, sort of get away from that. Um, we have the Ballerina Wrap Top by Alexandra Tavell. But, you know, we have the Cardi Jumper, which is another beautiful cardigan. But kind of a little... I was actually thinking about this one also for this project because I think that it would suit very well. But, um, you know, I think that... It's just not quite the look that I'm going for, but this is another beautiful cardigan. And this is by Inez of Bear Knit, um, but not quite the look that I'm looking for. So that's kind of how you would just go through and select what it is that you're looking for. And then again, because you're in, you know, Ravelry, you're gonna see all of that information. So this is the Paul cardigan. Oh, I forget who this designer was, but this is, um, I think, a new to me designer. I don't think that I've heard of them before. But yeah, again, you're going to see all of the things. You're going to see the yarns that people have used. You're going to see the gauge, the yardage, the needle information and, um, you know, additional information. You can also then start looking through projects as you normally would. And yeah, this is kind of how I go about sort of looking for a pattern um, whenever I am starting with the yarn and I don't know the pattern that I'm actually going to knit. So with all that said, I'm sure you want to know what pattern I've actually chosen to knit. And it is the pattern that I purposely skipped. It is the April Cardigan by Petite Knit. And this Cardigan is hitting all of the spots for me in terms of what I want. Um, for this cardigan, I specifically do not want a raglan because I do not like the way that raglan cardigans fit on me. I feel like they tend to just fall off my shoulders a lot. So we are going to go with one that has a contiguous construction. Contiguous. So that is why I have chosen this cardigan or one of the reasons, it is v-neck, it is extremely simple as most petite knit patterns are. And um, yeah, I mean, I just, it's just a, a basic pattern. Um, and again, I'm just really loving that contiguous construction. I think that it's really gonna sit nicely on my shoulders. And then another reason why I specifically chose this as well is because the cardigan is actually designed in a fingering weight held with a mohair. So I think that, you know, sometimes you can sub out either a sport or a DK weight for a fingering weight held with mohair and vice versa. If a pattern is already sport weight or DK weight, you can just do a fingering weight with mohair. But I think that this pattern is really hitting it all. I'm using a fingering weight with mohair, which this pattern does. It has a contiguous top-down construction, which is what I was looking for. It's very simple, it's V-neck, it hits all the spots. And so, yeah, so here we have the gauge information. It's gonna be 21 stitches to four inches, all the various yardage information. 
And then this is where we can see about the April cardigan. So it, it has a V neckline and is worked from the top down. The first part of the yoke is worked with the shoulder increases on both the right side and the wrong side, and then so on and so forth. And then if you really wanted to go ahead and see some of the various different patterns that have been made, they are all here. And so with that, I'm going to stop my recording. And that is how I go about choosing a pattern when I am starting with the yarn. Now I did get ahead of the game a little bit and I did swatch for this pattern. And so this is my swatch. And um, I've already blocked this swatch. And so I swatched with two different needle sizes and I have identified the fabric that I like the most. I do have gauge for this. And um, yeah, so this is going to be what I end up knitting my cardigan in. And so what is going on here? My camera is now telling me that it is overheating. So I'm gonna have to stop this portion of the video for now. And then I will likely come back and finish recording a little bit later on. But that's kind of how I go through my process of choosing a pattern when I already have the yarn in my stash and the different considerations that I might take when choosing that pattern. And again, I'm gonna go ahead and link to Haley's video down below so that you can really take a look at that because that video is like super informative and Haley is definitely a yarn nerd, which I'm not saying that I'm not, but definitely maybe not to that extent. Um, and, you know, she goes into other considerations to think about, like in terms of, you know, the type of yarn, the spin, the how the yarn is processed, you know, superwash versus non-superwash and all of that jazz. So definitely be sure to check out that video. Okay, so we've given the camera some time to cool. I've gone ahead and had dinner and we can go ahead and wrap up this episode. I just have two more things to chat through with you. And um, yeah, I think this is going to be quite the long one, uh, which makes sense since, you know, it's been quite some time. Um, but yeah, so I guess I will finish off with my making plans as well as with the numbers. So first, in terms of my making plans, I know that we are well into the month as I am recording this podcast. Um, and that's actually probably why you've seen quite a bit of progress um, in terms of January, I really didn't do much knitting. Um, a lot of my knitting happened in February and specifically when we were down visiting our grandparents. And I actually only finished two of these in March. So the hat and the scarf. Um, but yeah, I, you know, since it's, we're very well into March at this point, we only have a few more weeks left. Um, in terms of my knitting plans and when the next episode will be up, there's not gonna probably be much in the way of finished objects. Um, so what I'm thinking is uh, that I will be working through my socks as I do um, with commuting and you know just various meetings or whatever it might be throughout the day. So I probably will be able to finish those socks sometime this month. Um, and then I'm really just going to be working on two knits. So one being the spring line tee. I don't think that I'm going to finish it in the next two to three weeks, but you know, you never know. Um, but that is my priority for the month since it is a test knit, although it's not due until the end of April. I think it's launching on May 5th, if I remember correctly. Um, and then I'm going to get started on my April cardigan. I'm really excited on getting started on my first cardigan for the year. And I do have plans for a couple more. Um, I do have quite a bit of stash yarn that was purchased with cardigans in mind. 
<laughs> um, way back when. So I think that this is finally kind of like everything coming together, right? You know, we have the fun make along that CC is hosting. We have the fact that I'm stash busting. So now we're using the yarn that I purchased for cardigans to make all the cardigans. And so hopefully, you know, that'll take us well into spring. Um, and yeah, depending on how summer goes, we may be even be able to wear some of them through summer, especially some of the lighter weight items. Um, if we have a mild summer again, like we did last year, I was still wearing, you know, my hand knits um, pretty much all summer last year, which is crazy um, to think about. So, so yeah, that's kind of my plans for the month. We're going to go ahead and finish the socks, make some good headway on the spring line tee, and get started on my April cardigan. I think that, as I've spoken to previously on the podcast, probably will be a lot less finished items from me this year. I am really more focused on the process than the number of projects that I am churning out. So, yeah, we'll see how the podcast unfurls from here on out and um, with that I guess I can get to the numbers. So I have gone ahead and created a little template for myself for the numbers so that I will have that here on the screen because I know that it is helpful for some of you all to see them as well as hear me say them. So in January I finished zero projects and I purchased zero yarn, so the month of January is just a big fat zero. And so getting into the February numbers, as I mentioned, there were some acquisitions, um, although most of them have been knit up pretty quickly, so that will account for in the numbers as well. But in terms of total amount in, and so as a reminder, my in category is going to include any yarn that I've purchased as well as any yarn that has been gifted. Um, it's also going to include any de-stash yarn. So any yarn that has been de-stashed, which so far I haven't done any de-stashing this year, it will be a minus toward that in number, if you will. So um, this month it's only acquisitions um, and the total yardage is 2,456 yards. So that is quite a bit of yards. It's about two sweaters quantities worth. Um, but as you saw, it was like sock yarn and things like that. So it kind of makes sense in terms of that yardage. And then in terms of amount out, so what I count in the out category is once a project is finished. So I'm not counting any whips, I'm not counting any half finished objects or anything like that. Once a project is completely finished, and then that goes in the out category. And so February, we had a total of 3,000 681 yards knit up um or I guess not all knit up in February but <laughs> the projects are finished in February so quite a bit of yardage there like a three sweater quantities worth of um projects which makes sense because I did actually finish two sweaters right and then like a million socks so that totally makes sense and so that brings our year to date total to a negative 1,225 yards. We are starting the year off strong. So I will have to go back and see what my total yarn usage was last year. I definitely, I think it was about 30,000 yards. I definitely don't think that I'm going to aim for that this year. That's a lot. Um, but I think that if I could get like a solid 10,000 yards in the negative for the year, I think I'll be in good shape. That's probably like six sweater quantities worth plus a few extra projects. And I think that this might be the year of the accessories for me as well because I am kind of just 
craving those smaller projects that are a little bit quicker and a little bit more mindless. So we'll see. Usually this time of the year is when I start churning out a lot of accessories. Um, as you saw, based on all my sack knitting and my hat knitting. Um, but yeah, I guess that is all I have to share with you all. If you have made it this far, thank you so much for sticking around. Um, of course, I have to ask you to do all the podcasty things. Please be sure to subscribe and hit that bell icon. And also um, give this video a thumbs up and comment down below. I always love to hear what you all are working on while knitting along with me or making whatever it is you're making actually you know sometimes I watch podcasts and and I might be sewing or I might actually even be cleaning my house whatever it is that you're doing let's just you know chat about it down below um also remember if you have any ideas for my two lonely skeins so one is the Sunday morning DK and the other is the West Yorkshire Spinners um color lab DK any ideas for either of those, leave them in the comments down below as well. And yeah, I guess with that, I will leave you here until the next video. My next video is going to be a knit and chat. Um, I don't think that I have the mental headspace yet to produce any kind of intense content for you all. So I'm just going to go ahead and sit and knit and chat with you all a little bit before the next month's podcast, which will be in April. And um, yeah, until there, until then, <laughs> please be sure to take care of yourselves, your loved ones and each other. And I'll see you in the next one. Bye.